man, so much stuff to celebrate. Uh, and uh, man, I'm so encouraged too. Uh, one, because I, I'm an alumni of Westside, so uh, there you go. Uh, and uh, hey, families over there, uh, I see a lot of families here that came to support uh, your teenagers. Man, thank you so much for just entrusting a little bit uh, of their story to us and l- letting us partner with you. And uh, man, we're, you're so valuable. Home is so important, and we're here to support you in anything uh, that we can do uh, for you as a family and support these teenagers. Uh, home is so important. Have you ever been homesick? Like, I mean, you know, just really homesick. I can remember when I was uh, 14, uh, my brother and I, who was 17 months older than I, uh, we went on a trip uh, without my parents. My, actually, uh, I don't know if my parents were trying to get rid of us for a month or what it was, but uh, they put us on a plane and sent us to some relatives uh, in Washington State. And so we spent a month, uh, my brother and I, in the mountains, at the ocean, uh, doing all kinds of fun stuff with some relatives that we had up there. Uh, and I can remember uh, kind of the anticipation of that. I mean, we were so excited uh, about getting to do that. One, uh, and some of the best fishing that I've ever experienced uh, in my life. Uh, we were on, the, uh, on this river that was coming off of the mountains uh, in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, just picturesque, beautiful. Uh, I mean, you're catching your limit as soon as you go out there. Uh, it's just, it just an amazing thing. And I remember going to the ocean. It was really the first time I'd seen the Pacific Ocean. And so I can remember going and uh, spending time on the beach and they had an RV and we would park uh, uh, at a campsite on the beach. And so we were there every day uh, doing that stuff. And then I can remember the place where they housed us. They brought us in and they put us uh, uh, in the basement and they had a room down there and it had a pool table, a foosball table, all this kind of stuff. And as a 14 year old, 15 year old uh, uh, guys, we were just thinking, man, we have, uh, I mean, we have really hit the big time here. I mean, we struck the lottery. We're going to get a a month away from like uh, all the chores because at my house, uh, summer was working in the garden. Uh, It was mowing the yard. Uh, My parents were working. And so we were getting dinner ready and making sure the house was clean and all that kind of stuff in between uh, playing uh, Defender on Atari. It was the 80s, okay? So there was a little bit of that going on uh, as well. Uh, but I can remember thinking, man, we just hit the lottery. We're going to be up here and you're no responsibilities. This is going to be a lot of fun. And it totally was. But something that I did not anticipate happened about a weekend. About a weekend, uh, we were there and I started feeling this uh, this feeling that I had not really felt before, this feeling called that I know now called homesickness. Uh, I started a, a feeling like this compulsion, this longing to be home, to desire to be home. And I can remember like there would be like three weeks left to go because this was about a week in, you know, uh, and the new was wearing off and I could start to feel this feeling, especially when I would lay down at night, uh, I would be there and the lights would go off and I, I would be able to kind of just be left with my thoughts. And I was thinking like, oh man, I, I, I miss my room. I, I miss home. Home. I miss my mom and dad. I, I miss my friends. I can all, all these type of things, and it was almost like all the things around me could not satisfy. Uh, all the fun couldn't satisfy me. I had this desire to get back home, knowing that if I was to go home, it was going to mean all the responsibilities. It was going to mean all the other stuff uh, with it. But I, I had relationships there. It was my place. Uh, it was home. And I felt that sense in, in several uh, noticeable moments. I can remember being a, a, a freshman in college and my parents uh, dropping me off at school. And at the time, I didn't have a, a, a car. I had to hitch a ride where we, wherever I would go. And I was three hours away from home. I can remember my parents dropping me off and driving away. And I was in my dorm room uh, with a guy I had never lived with before. And I was there by myself with no way to get home and wondering what it would be like. And I, I was so excited about the opportunity to go to college. I was ready to go. I was was ready to move out, but what I did not expect was within two days, I was, I was longing for home. I was missing for home. And I, I felt that other times. I mean, I, I'm in my 40s now, and I have felt that even when my wife and I would go away for a vacation or our family would go away for a vacation, uh, I miss home. I miss my bed. I, I miss where, knowing where things are in the cabinets, uh, all that kind of stuff. I even miss the mess uh, and all the things that come with it. And I believe that that's something that is hardwired into all of us. Like, nobody taught me that. That was something that was just hardwired into being human, uh, this desire to be home. Some of you, that's not your experience at all, though. Uh, Some of you, your home life was not good. Uh, And if you could have gotten away from home, you you would have. Some of you, when you think about home, you think about pain, and you think about heartache, and you think about uh, all kinds of horrible things. 
But what I would suggest to you today is whether or not you long for home or you longed to get away from home, it really is the same undercurrent. It's the desire for something more. It's desire for something that is, it, the, it is embedded within us, a place to call home. So whether or not it's from a positive experience or a negative one, we all know what it's like to long for a place where we can be fully known, fully loved, and we can extend that same to those around us. I say that because that's not just a human emotion, that's a spiritual phenomenon. I would say that what we experience on a human level really taps into and points us to a deeper truth, something that God wants to get at, at the heart of who we are and what we were designed to be. Because as much as we're designed for a human home, God wants us to, not, wants us to know that we're also designed for a spiritual home, an eternal home. And if you've ever felt the longing for more, that you have in this life, if you've ever, whatever stage you're in, if you've ever felt a little disenchanted with life and you've asked the question, is there not more to this? I'd like to put my finger on that and say, I think that's you longing for home. A famous writer named C.S. Lewis, uh, he, he expressed that sentiment this way. Uh, C.S. Lewis so long ago said this, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that we were created for another world, that there is something intrinsic to being human. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to try to recapture home. We're going to see that what Jesus did was really making a way for home. We're going to be in John chapter 14 today. This is a passage of scripture that has uh, famously been termed the farewell discourse uh, it basically is the last few conversations that Jesus had uh, before he went to the cross, before he ultimately died. We're approaching Easter, and so over the next three weeks, what we're going to be doing together is we're going to be just looking uh, and focusing on the person of Jesus as we look to celebrate the resurrection. But before the resurrection, there was a crucifixion. And before the crucifixion, there was a discussion, there was a dialogue where people had to come to terms with what Jesus, who Jesus was and exactly what it was that he came to do. And our hope is that as we focus on this same passage of scripture for the next three weeks, uh, what God will do is give us a new appreciation for the identity and the person of Jesus and the invitation home that he extends us. Because today what we're going to look at is the fact that Jesus is the way. I want you to look with me in John chapter 14, verse 1. We're going to start there, work down through the first part of the passage. And then we'll land at verse 6 uh, and 7 and finish there. This is how John 14 uh, introduces this farewell discourse. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. These are the words of Jesus himself. Uh, and, and I say this because uh, uh, there's a lot of different opinions about Jesus today, okay? There always has been. There's, there's always been opinions about Jesus. And depending on where your background is or, uh, or who you're connected to or maybe what even your church background is, you're going to get a lot of different opinions um, and a lot of different labels uh, with Jesus. But the beauty of uh, the gospel is and the beauty of Scripture is, is that when we open Scripture, we don't have to go through someone else's opinion. We're able to get from the mouth of God himself, Jesus himself. Uh, and it's something we can all appreciate because uh, I, I know you, you, you would not want someone to misrepresent you. Uh, if someone misrepresented you to a friend, you would say, well, why didn't you come talk to me? Why didn't you come listen to me? I could have told you what my thoughts were about that, what my feelings were about that. And so what we have in John chapter 14 is we have the actual words of Jesus. We have Jesus himself speaking to us. And so if you've been uh, pushed out of church or uh, you're kind of like looking at church and looking at faith and you're like, I, I don't know about you. I understand that. I understand that you, know, you don't know me uh, perhaps. And maybe you, you shouldn't trust me because you don't know me. But what I would invite you to do is let's look at what Jesus said. And what Jesus said in this situation was he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. In order to understand what's going on, you have to understand some of the people around him. This is a, a, a famous interlude or episode, if you will, uh, of Jesus with his disciples. The disciples were a group of people that had followed Jesus around. Uh, they had learned from Jesus. They uh, began to, uh, to kind of pass, uh, take up the baton that Jesus would pass to them to be able to do ministry in his name after he was gone. And so they spent about three years with Jesus. 
But right before John 14 is John 13. And John 13 is a famous scene because it's something that uh, we've typically referred to as the Last Supper. Uh, you might have seen a, a famous piece of artwork called the Last Supper. Well, it, it commemorates the event of John chapter 13. And some significant things happen in John chapter 13. One of the things that happened was Jesus uh, celebrated this meal called Passover with his, uh, his immediate followers. But he did something really interesting because he took up these elements so they would share bread and wine together. But he did something startling. He took the bread, he broke it, and then he said, hey, this, this bread is my body that's broken for you. And then as they would take the wine to drink it and he served his disciples, he said, hey, uh, this is my blood that is going to be shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And I want you, every time you take it, I want you to remember me. And so that, that set their minds reeling. They, they took this event, this meal together, and then Jesus was saying, remember me. And the reason he was saying, remember me, is because he also uh, introduced them to the fact that he's about to go away. He's about to go away. He's not going to be with them anymore. Now, if you're a disciple, this is a startling thing because you, you've been following him everywhere. You've given up everything to follow Jesus. Uh, you've been eating with him. You've been uh, fishing with him. You've been crying with him. You've been laughing with him. And your hope would be that as now we're getting close to marching into Jerusalem, that we're going to get to celebrate together. This is a big climactic moment. And then right as you're on the cusp, as right on sure at the climax of this three-year journey with Jesus, he announces that he's about to die and that he's about to go away and you're not going to see him again. And then to make matters worse, he also says that in this room that have been following me, your friends, there's going to be some of you that are actually going to betray me. And famously what happens, Judas gets up from the table, he goes out and he sells Jesus out to the Romans and to the leaders of the Sanhedrin. And then from that, as Judas watches out, marches out, we looked at this a few weeks ago, that Peter, he turns to Peter as Peter says to him, hey, I'm not going to ever betray you. I'll always be with you to the end. And then Jesus says to the leader of the band, you too are going to betray me. And let me just ask you, what would you be feeling if you were in the room that night? What would you have felt at dinner with Jesus? Would you have felt confusion? Would you have felt fear? Maybe anger? Maybe you would be asking some questions, but here's the reason you'd be asking all these questions is because the future was so uncertain. You would be asking these questions because you thought Jesus was the answer and now everything you thought was true seemed like it was unraveling. Friends are leaving. Jesus' countenance is different. And Jesus picks up on the tone and the posture of the room. He can see it on their faces. He can hear it in their words. I don't know if there were whispers or if it was just the, the look on their face of shock. But what happened? Jesus noticed their trouble. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Now, what's interesting about that is because this word has been used in John's gospel. John, John apparently likes this word, troubled. Matter of fact, most of the time that it's been used up to this point has been in reference to Jesus himself. And this is really important because this helps us to understand who Jesus is, the personhood of Jesus, the humanness of Jesus. Because what does Jesus do? He notices their trouble. But that's not all. Jesus actually knew what it was like to be troubled. Watch what happened in John chapter 12, verse 27. This was just a couple chapters preceding this. This is Jesus talking. He said, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. John 12 is picking up on the tension and the humanness of Jesus as he knew where he was headed and he was troubled about his future. Uh, he, he, was, he was concerned about where he was going. He knew that he was going ultimately to die on a cross, though no one else understood. He knew what he was going to experience. And so Jesus himself was experiencing trouble. So this means that Jesus, God in the flesh, knew trouble enough to recognize trouble. And I say this to you because this is that some of you, you look at Jesus and you don't think he knows your trouble. You don't think, oh, how could Jesus know my trouble? But scripture tells us over and over again, when we actually look at Jesus and we hear his words, we know that this is a God, this is a person that actually knew what it felt like to feel what you feel. So it's, it's not confusing, is it, that in the room that night, he, being someone who knew what it was to feel trouble, could notice trouble. And some of you need to know that, because you came in here with trouble. 
You carried trouble in with you. And I don't know if it was a health issue, a relationship issue, a financial issue, or maybe it's questions about faith and the uncertainty of the future after we've been through this crazy year. I don't know what's going on, but you've got some trouble. And so if the message for you today might not be anything else that said that God knows your trouble and he sees your trouble. Jesus felt that trouble, but it wasn't the only time. Matter of fact, in the chapter right after that, between 12 and 14 and 13, this is what he said. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit, and he testified very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. See, John's trying to set up the feeling. Jesus is troubled. Everyone in the room is troubled. But it's interesting, isn't it? Then they don't notice Jesus' trouble. They become consumed with their own trouble. Because this is what happens when we experience tr trouble. When we experience trouble, the questions begin to build. The questions begin to build about what if, what's the future hold? We thought this was going to go this way, and now it doesn't look like the plan is playing out. What are we, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? How is this going to play out? What's going to happen with Jesus? And then what they were really asking is, what's going to happen with me? And this is the question of all the questions, right? This is the question that we all wrestle with when we don't even know sometimes how to verbalize this is what's going to happen in the future. And so what happened, Jesus notices the trouble and this is how he corrects or he, he guides through the trouble. Knowing your trouble, this is what he says to the disciples in that moment. He says, you believe in God, believe also in me. What's the answer to your trouble? Jesus says, I know your trouble. I felt trouble. And here's what I'm going to... Here's what I'm going to call you to do. I'm going to call you to believe. Now, the way the translation, translation excuse me, reads, it reads like one's an indicative and one's an imperative. All right, like, um, hey, you believe in God. He's assuming. It sounds like he's assuming that they believe in God. And he says, if you believe in God, then go ahead and just believe in me. And, and you could translate it that way, but a lot of commentators and uh, scholars will actually say, well, it's probably more like they're both imperatives. Probably a more accurate translation was Jesus looking into their troubled souls, and he's actually calling them to believe. Hey, I know you're troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me. Because that's the first thing that goes, isn't it, when the trouble comes, is the trust. When the trouble comes and the questions build, then there seems like there's got to be a lot of answers, and, a lot, and answers are hard to find in the midst of trouble. It's hard to answer all the questions of everybody and of yourself. And so Jesus says, hey, the starting point of your trouble is the trust in God. And he does something really powerful because he's already demonstrated his humanness. But what he's doing and in insinuating this moment is he's actually suggesting and introducing not his humanness, but his godness. That Jesus was 100% man and 100% God at the same time. As a matter of fact, he's associating something John's been trying to say from the very beginning of his gospel writing uh, in John chapter 1. He's trying to help us to understand that when you see Jesus, you're seeing God. And so it's not a far jump to when you believe in Jesus, you're believing in God. One, one um, example of that happened earlier in John's gospel, in John chapter 5. He, he drew the correlation between himself and God. He said, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. It's what you heard in these baptism testimonies today, that when you put your faith in Jesus, you're putting your faith in God because Jesus is God. John introduced it that way in John chapter 1, verse 1. If you remember, he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. It says that through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made, and in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. That when you see Jesus, you're seeing God, that God uh, revealed himself, that Jesus is the self-revelation of God. And so if you're asking questions, if you're in trouble, if you're looking to the future, then what Jesus would say is he would say, trust in me, look to me, believe in me. Not look into another person, not look into a denomination, not look into uh, uh, the latest political movement or the latest self-help technique, looking to God himself. 
See, Jesus had, was famous for saying this. He continually say, said this kind of stuff. In John chapter 12, was one more example, just real quick. He said that Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. If you see Jesus, you're seeing God. So you have a God in Jesus that, that knew all the trouble, and he was completely human. And then he was 100% God at the same time. Like this is is powerful. What this is, is that when we are called to put our faith in Jesus, he's really calling us to do really four basic things. When Jesus calls us to see him for who he is, the first thing he's calling us to do is to believe in his identity. This is who Jesus is. Again, pushing past all the popular uh, skeptical things about who Jesus is. If you just look at Jesus, and I want to invite you to do that over the next three weeks as we approach Easter. I mean, what if this next three weeks was just an invitation just to open the gospel of John in the Bible? Maybe you haven't read the Bible ever, or maybe you never, haven't read the Bible in a long time. What if you just said, I don't know where to start. I just told you where to start. What if you just opened the gospel of John? You said, I'm not going to try to understand everything. I'm just going to listen to Jesus. And if you listen to Jesus very long in John's gospel, you're going to find out who he is, that he is God. And he's come for a purpose. And the thing that I think you'll find when you see his identity is he's going to call you actually to believe in his character. You're going to see the character of Jesus. And this is important because a lot of us have so many misconceptions of Jesus. We impress upon Jesus so much of our experience or, or maybe what we've heard or conjecture. But if we listen to Jesus, what we're going to understand is that this guy, he, he was somebody that moved with authority and power while simultaneously walking in grace and mercy and love. This was somebody that uh, he pushed back on the religious leaders for their fake religion and somebody that actually uh, embraced outsiders, people that thought that they were so far away from home that they could never get home again. And this is the Jesus that you'll find. You'll, you'll find somebody that you can trust his character. He's a good and good God. And when you trust his character and you see his identity, the other thing you're going to be tapped into is you're going to be tapped into his power. The thing you're going to see about Jesus is that he was powerful. I mean, everyone was just uh, blown away. Nobody denied his power. They, they, they wrestled with and argued about where that power come, came from. Uh, but nobody could argue that this man was powerful. When he spoke, he spoke with power. People were amazed when they'd hear him speak. They said, we, we hear him speak, and he speaks like no one that we've ever heard before because he speaks as one who has authority. And then we see him walking on water. We see him raising the dead. We see him caring for people that are, uh, have been uh, overcome by demonic oppression, people that have overcome by illness, that didn't have any answer. We see a God that moved in power. And when we see his identity, and we begin to connect with his character, and we begin to see and experience his power, then we begin to look and see that he has a plan. Jesus, the God of identity, the God of character, and the God of power, he came with a plan. That Jesus, being God in the flesh, didn't come here on accident. He didn't come here for a vacation. He came because he had a plan. And the question that was asked in the room that day, the question that was the undercurrent of all the disciples, and the reason they were troubled is they were listening to Jesus and they could not understand his plan. Has that ever, ever occurred to you when you've looked at the news or experienced life? You've asked the question, God, I, I don't understand. This doesn't look like you're here. We just sang about it. Like even when I don't see it, you're working. Like that's a statement of faith because that's the definition of faith. Like when I don't see you moving, when I don't feel you working, like that's actually trusting that you actually have a plan in all this craziness, in all this mess. So in John 14, verse 2, he actually gives us a look in to his plan. He says, I don't want you to be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. And why should you do that? Because in my father's house has many rooms. And if that were not so, would I have, not told, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you, here's what, here's what he says into the trouble. He says, my, my father's house has many rooms. Now, if you've been to a funeral, you've probably heard this passage read. I mean, I've, pro I've probably done 100 funerals or so, and uh, probably 90% of the funerals I've been to have had this passage of Scripture somewhere woven in to this, because this is something we look at 
And we look to the future because when we're, when we're at loss, we're trying to find the hope and find the plan. And what Jesus actually does is he gives us the plan. And he says, and my father's house has many rooms. Now, the question then is, what is he talking about? And there's a lot of different um, opinions on exactly what he's talking about. But I, I think that John gives us a hint. I think he wants us to understand the plan of Jesus. And I think just as Jesus wanted them to understand the plan, I think he wants us to understand the plan. So my question would be, was, well, if he's talking about his father's house, what's he talking about? Where is this and what, what's going to happen? Well, one of the hints I think he gives us is in John chapter 2. This is the first time you see in John's gospel that phrase, my father's house, actually come on the scene. In John chapter 2, verse 16, to those who sold doves, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Anybody know where we are? Anybody? He's in the temple, right? Remember, this is that famous scene. Everybody loves this scene. Jesus comes in, he turns the tables over, and he drives people out of the temple and all that kind of stuff, right? He, but why? Because they were selling sacrifices. Basically, they had turned the temple into a joke. And what Jesus says, he said, hey, I'm going to come in. This is not what my father's house was created for. And then when he did that, his disciples that were with him, they remembered that Scripture actually had written this phrase, in the Old Testament, our Old Testament, it says that zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove that you have the authority to do all this? Remember, he had power and authority. Well, why do you have this authority? Where does it come from? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. And so we know now what they did not understand in the moment, that Jesus was talking about the temple, but the temple reference is something very powerful, and it's something that actually is thread together from Genesis to Revelation on the heart of God, and it has everything to do with an invitation to home. The first time you see the temple is actually demonstrated in the first two chapters of Genesis. And it's a scene that's famous because it's the garden scene. You remember the garden scene? Uh, Jesus, uh, God steps out into the void. He creates everything that is. Seven days of creation. You get to Genesis chapter 2. And it tells us in detail that there was a garden that was in the middle uh, of a place, a place called Garden of Eden. And this was the place where heaven and earth overlapped this is a place where God, from place that God resides to where mankind, humankind resides. This is where uh, mankind actually walked with God. They shared in communion with God. Uh, men and women together were fully transparent and open without shame and with God. They were completely at home with themselves, with creation, and with God. But by Genesis chapter 3, Everything, the wheels come off, right? Because they don't want to live in God's good kingdom. They want, to do, they want to actually construct their own kingdom. And what happens is the fracture of the overlap between heaven and earth is broken because they want to create their own planet. They want to create their own world, their own kingdom. They want a kingdom without a king. And what happens from that point forward is the story is of how will God remedy the situation and bring lost people back home? And so if you play the story out and uh, if you look through uh, what is, again, our, what we would call our Old Testament, which is the Jewish scriptures, uh, the story from that point forward becomes the place that describes where God would meet with his people. And God began first with the tabernacle, and then he introduced a place called the temple, which is what we just talked about. It's the scene from where Jesus is. For about a thousand years on that plot of land in Jerusalem was a place called the temple. And if you've never seen it before, uh, the temple that Herod constructed looks a little bit like this. This is a model or a mock-up of what the temple would have looked like. This is a magnificent, huge structure, very detailed, very ornate. And if you were to go inside, you would find out there's a lot of different rooms in the temple. But there's one room at the center of the temple, and it's called the Holy of Holies. It's the place where uh, only uh, uh, one person could go one time a year into the presence of God on behalf of the people. And so the Spirit of God would come down, and it became the centerpiece of the life of faith of God's people, and, and rightfully so. Why? Because God always desired to be with his people. And so the temple was constructed so that it would be a constant reminder and it would be a constant presence for the people of God to always brought, be drawn back home. Matter of fact, if you were to walk into the temple, what you would find is, uh, you can see it described in 1 Kings chapter 6 through 8. 
They would actually uh, adorn the inside of the temple with decorations that actually mimicked a garden scene. There would be symbols and signs. There would be a menorah that was supposed to uh, emulate the tree of life. There would be uh, smells and incense burning. It was supposed to conjure and call you back home to be a reminder of the way back home. But as you saw in John chapter 2, right, the, the temple had actually become a farce. It had become a joke. And you see the story of Israel over and over again. They thought that just having the structure meant that they were with God. And so by the time you get to Jesus, when Jesus arrives on the scene in John chapter 1, in verse 14 of John 1, it says that uh, God, became, Jesus, uh, the Word, excuse me, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And it says that we've all seen his glory, the glory of the one uh, and only, begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, Right? And so what does that mean? That word dwelling means the presence, it's tabernacle, that God actually tabernacled with us through the person of Jesus. And so what, was, what does that mean? That means that when Jesus was talking in John chapter 2, he says that when you tear this temple down, he was talking about himself, I'm going to raise the temple up in three days. Why was he talking and doing that, that kind of thing? Because he was calling us home, the place where God would be with his people. Well, immediately after John 14, John 15, 16, and 17, what does Jesus do? Jesus actually says that the new temple then will become you and I. He says that the Holy Spirit will actually come into you. He actually told them, uh, because they were still wondering, he said, it's actually good for you that I go away, because unless I go away, the Holy Spirit cannot come, for you, come uh, into you, and he will be the one that leads you into truth that the Holy Spirit will reside in us. And this is a thought that Paul and Peter will later pick up on. Paul and Peter both will say, hey, listen, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why what you do with your body matters, because it's sacred space. It's the place where God's Spirit resides. Peter would say that when you come together, you're actually a temple where the Spirit lives. You're actually bricks of the temple, that the Spirit is no longer residing in a, in a physical structure. It's residing in the people that contain the Spirit of God. So the temple, the place where God meets with his people is you and me, the church. And the culmination of the whole story, remember we went from Genesis to through the Old Testament to Jesus to today, that it actually culminates at the end in a book called The Revelation with the new heaven and the new earth. And interestingly, the same uh, uh, author, the same guy that's recording the Gospel of John, actually wrote the last book in the Bible called The Revelation. And if you were to go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, what you're going to find is you're going to find a reinstatement of heaven and earth uniting, where God will create a permanent, eternal home for his people. Revelation 21.3 shares that thought. It says, I he heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. And if you skip down to verse 21, uh, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 22, he said, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So do you see what Jesus did? Jesus brought back and he fixed the problem and he did that so that we could be ushered back into a relationship because here's the thing about home. Home is about presence. Home is not about a structure. It's not about this building. This is uh, actually effectually not the church, all right? We say that sometimes, hey, I'm gonna go to church. But what we don't mean is that this building is the church. This physical address, 1701 Disciple Drive, is not the church, the church is us. We are the people of God with the presence of God, and we are walking out in the plan of God. And so remember what Jesus said in the, in the room that night in John chapter 14? What did he say? He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am because it's about presence. God wants to be with us. And he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going which is kind of funny, right? And the reason I say it's funny because watch what Thomas says to him. Thomas actually says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Now, you've probably heard of Thomas before because Thomas is uh, usually uh, referred to by the moniker Doubting Thomas, all right? He gets kind of a bad rap 
uh, between this and episode after the resurrection where he says, hey, can I put my finger uh, in, the, in the scars and lift your hand? He, he's kind of that skeptical person, which I can always connect with Thomas, right? So I, when I look at Thomas, I think, well, he's not really, he shouldn't be doubting Thomas. He should be brave Thomas because he's the one in the room that's actually willing to ask the hard question that everyone else is thinking, but nobody wants to say when Jesus says, hey, you know where I'm about to go. And this is what they're all thinking. We have no idea what you're talking about, Jesus. A matter of fact, most of the time when we ask you questions, you just give us questions back. It's so confusing. And even when you answer us, you usually answer us what sounds like a riddle. I mean, sure, you call them parables, but let's just be honest, they're riddles. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. And so Thomas breaks in and he says, listen, we're all troubled here. Jesus says, hey, you know, you know where I'm going. And he says, we have no idea where you're going. And so if we can't know where you're going, how are we going to know the way? And this is logical reasoning. Because anytime you, you want to go somewhere that you've never been before, what's the first thing you do with your phone? You enter the destination address. And it's so convenient, we don't think about it anymore, but I remember when we used to have to carry atlases and maps around in the car, right? Uh, but now, you just pull your phone out. Hey, how do you get to Chicago? Oh, well, I'll just pull, pull that up. Okay, well, you don't even think about it till you get on the road. Now, because you know, you can just enter the destination, because when you know the destination... You can construct the way. But this is what Jesus says that's so mysterious and so powerful. What Jesus says is, if you follow me, you don't have to know the location. You just have to know the person. Because what you get with me is you get the way. You get the direction. And if you're with me, then you're going to end up in the right place. And some of us, I say that because I'm a skeptic. I'm assuming some of you are skeptics, and I would say that all your questions are reasonable and true, or else you wouldn't ask them. You wouldn't think about that. But my question to you would be like, how many questions do you need answers before you will believe and trust in Jesus? How how, how much do you need to know about the afterlife? How much do you need to know about how God's going to work out every detail? I mean, if you've ever read Revelation, you know there's a bunch of questions in there, right? Right? I mean, there's all kinds of um, opinions on by, well, are you premillennial? Are you amillennial? Are you postmillennial? Are you pre-tribulation? Are you post-tribulation? Is it figurative? Is it literal? There's all kinds of questions. And here's what Jesus would say. He would say, I know you've got questions about dinosaurs. I know you've got questions about the future. But what I want you to do is I want you to push out everything else. And I just want to eyeball to eyeball. I want to look at you and I want you to look at me. Because if you will look to me, then you can find the way. And here's how I know that. Because this is what he says. He goes on to say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He said, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Here's the beautiful thing about Jesus. Jesus simplifies it for us. He came to reveal God to us as God, fully God, fully man, in order to help us to be able to see the way home, to answer the question, the angst, the undercurrent of disenchantment that we all feel sometimes, or sometimes it's so heavy and so pervasive, we wonder if it's even right for us to go on. And Jesus says, I understand, but I am the way. Matter of fact, he invites everyone home. Back in John chapter 12, verse 32, he said these words. He says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. Where was Jesus going to prepare a way? He was going to the cross to prepare a way. He was being raised up on a cross, not just so a select few could find their way home, but so that all people will be drawn home. Because the way, ultimately, is not a path, it's a person. It's not a path. It's not your own plan. It's it's not you being a better person. It's not this denomination or that denomination. It's, It's not what you can do for him, and hopefully you'll earn favor with him. It's what Jesus came to do, to bring everyone back home. You see, that's the plan. And God wants to invite you home right now. He wants to invite you home. 
There's an old song. Uh, I don't remember the whole thing, but there's an old hymn. It says, oh, my soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. And I do think that that's true today. It's hard when there's so much darkness around. And our soul becomes weary and troubled. But he says, with light, for look at a Savior and life abundant and free. What God does is he invites us through the person of Jesus. He invites us back home. You want to go, go home? You feel homesick? You can find your way back home. I'm going to ask if you would, if you would bow your head and close your eyes for me. Rachel's going to come out and, and play for us for just a second. But as we finish up, what I'm going to ask you to do is simply this. I'm going to ask you, do you long for home? You heard some testimonies today from uh, some teenagers that found their way home. And I think what they would say to you is, if, if God could bring me home, he could bring you home. And you don't have to be ashamed if you're in your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, your 70s. Jesus came for every person because he said that if I will be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And that includes you. And my question to you today is, do you believe his identity? Do you trust his character? Do you see his power? And do you trust his plan? And would you give your life to him today? Would you begin to follow him today? And all it takes is one step toward home. He's already come and opened the door. He's made everything ready. He's, he's constructed the house. And it is a beautiful house. It's constructed for you, where you can be in his presence and you can feel the goodness and the joy and the peace and the wholeness that all of us have always been longing for. And it says that it begins easily enough if you would today consider him for who he is and receive him for what he's done. And so would you do that today? Would you right there in the privacy of your own mind and heart, would you now, if you need to, would you just say to God, God, I receive your Lord and, you as my Lord and Savior. I put my faith and trust in you. And I want to begin to follow you. Thanks for opening the home for me and making a place for me. If you prayed that, that's a really good start today to have a conversation with one of us uh, so that we can help you continue to grow in your faith. Matter of fact, as soon as this service is over, I'm gonna invite you. I'll be out at the Welcome Center. I would love to chat with you and pray with you. And we've got another team, men and women, that would love to do the same to help you move toward and know what it looks like to live at home. And then the other thing I'm gonna ask you to do, uh, if you would call this place home, if you would consider this place journey your church home. I was just thinking this morning as I was working through this in my mind, I saw this picture of our home at, uh, where we live, my family. And uh, I went out a few weeks ago and I bought a welcome mat and put it at the front door. And that was a way to signify to everyone that would happen by our place that they are welcome in our home. And it's a powerful image. It's a simple one, but it's a powerful image. And I want to ask you, if you call this place home, would you ask God to make us a welcome mat? There's nothing glamorous about a welcome mat. People step on it to get in the house. They wipe their feet on it. Welcome mats get dirty. They get dingy. They get tattered and torn but they are there simply to welcome people into the house. And my prayer is that this church, no matter what happens in the future, will always be a place that we are underfoot, not lording it over, not a picture on the wall, but we are a welcome mat for the world that would say, welcome, welcome home. Would you pray that God would make you a welcome mat? I know it's a strange prayer, but would you pray that, whatever it would take? Would you pray that over our church today? Father, that's our desire. Our desire is to come home, do it collectively, and to be a welcome man to welcome people home. 
And we know that there's a world out there that uh, they're longing for home. They might not even know it or might not even call it that, but they're giving themselves to so many things like we all do in the hopes that it will fill that void and that vacuum that can only be found in your presence. And so, Lord, we want to, with joy, we want to open the door wide for people. We want to welcome people that have dirty feet to come on in. And, God, we want to be a place that celebrates and has a banquet, like you talk about in Revelation, where we, we celebrate, we, da- we, we dance, and we drink, and we eat, all because of your goodness, and we're there together as your people, enjoying what you've created us to be and what you've created us to do. And that's to worship you forever and forever. That's our prayer. We ask this together in Jesus' name. Amen.